Uh, hello, music friends. This is HEK, back for another installment of three albums. And today we are with Will Paradise of Paradise Records. How's it going this morning? Great. Excellent. How are you doing? I'm good. Um, Will, tell us about how you came to own this record store in Boulder, Colorado. Well, the short version is uh, I had a job, and after 29 years, I retired. And after six months of being retired, I was, I was an avid record buyer for since I was you know, nine, ten years old. I was a customer at Bart's Record Shop, and I was friends with Bart. I had the conversation, like, I want to buy it, or be a partner or something. He wasn't into selling, and then, like, two weeks later, he goes to Maryland, finds this piece of property for him and his wife, and he's like, I'm ready to sell. And it went from, like, no, it's not, I'm not doing it, and then I'm ready to sell. And so it oh, was... Wow. Perfect timing. My wife's like, "Look, this is like a sign. You got to do it." And so that was almost seven years ago to the day. So wow. I needed. To, I wanted something to do to keep me busy. I wanted to keep vinyl alive in Boulder, and I wanted to just pursue my passion. So it's just a labor of love, and I love being here. You lived in the Boulder area a long time. I moved here in 2000, so yeah, okay. 23 years. Yeah, I've heard stories about back in the day that there were tons of record stores here. Yeah, uh, supposedly in the 70s there were more record stores per capita in Boulder than anywhere in the United States. Oh, wow. <laughs> and now we're down to one or two? Now we're down to one in Boulder, three in Longmont, uh, Netherlands, Boogie Records in Netherlands. Yeah, so. yeah, it's sad to see albums on the hill go, oh, yeah. some kind of institution. For sure. So how long have you been at this location on Pearl? It'll be two years on April 1st, okay. so 22 months right now. It's mm -hmm. great. I love the space. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. Me too. All right. Well, we're going to get right into it. Number one, what is the record that everyone should have in their collection? It's like picking your favorite child, right? I mean, yeah. <laughs> there's at least a hundred records you could name off the top of your head. Right. But for me, I'll pull mine out here. For me, it's easy. It's Dark Side of the Moon. Here's two pressings. Oh, wow. And uh, it's Dark Side of the Moon. Um, you know, uh, it's, it's actually coming up on the 50 year anniversary. It was released March 1st, 1973. So the 50 year anniversary wow. is coming up. This is a record I've been listening to my entire life. I was 13 when it came out and it's a go-to record. This record sold over 45 million copies since it came out. And there's a lot of interesting stories about this record. This is a Japanese pressing, which is probably the second best sounding record I own. Wow. This is a Mobile Fidelity pressing, which is also a great pressing, and there's many pressings of this album, over 800 different pressings of this album, but anyways, this, everyone should have this record. It's a quintessential, you know, psych rock, prog rock, rock, themed albums, it's, yeah. You know, it's interesting, it's still one of our top selling records, and in the United States. This, this record also spent, you know, the longest time on the Billboard Top 500. It was over 10 years on the Billboard like Top 500 records of all, you know. That's and, amazing. And on the Rolling Stone, like, Top 100 list, I think it's number 51 now, uh, like the greatest record of all time. But, you know, uh, when people come in and they're looking for records, you know, there's numerous ones that they're looking at, you know, Beatles records, Stones records, so many you can direct them to. But this is really a go-to and a go-to record for me. I love listening to this album, usually at least once a month at home late night glass of bourbon love listening to this record that's great and you have two different copies that's so two, cool yeah two different tell copies. me a little bit more about the japanese pressing where'd you find that uh you know on the collection that we bought um uh, we, we bought a collection up in carbondale i had already had a, a japanese pressing but this one was in better shape that's one of the best things one of the main reasons also buying a record store is like <laughs> to get you know first crack at all the records that come in oh and yeah it's just amazing because when you flip through these bo boxes of, of records you know, there's so many common records, which is great. Those are the ones everybody wants to buy, but the ones that stand out, it's sort of like in, you know, Pulp Fiction when they lift the suitcase and the gold is kind of shining oh, out. Yeah. All of a sudden you see this record and you're like, I gotta have that. So, uh, yeah, and I, I really am fond of Japanese pressings. I think they sound amazing. And we bought a collection, you know, a, a while back that had over 800 in it. So it was pretty, wow. pretty exciting. When you first opened the store, did some of your own personal collection become part of the store, or did you have enough inventory you didn't really need to do that? Well, you know, one of the things that was different than with uh, many record stores that start up, start up um, 
you know, I bought an existing record store. So there was already inventory at Bart's at the time, and we were a 900 square foot store. So some of my records came in, but like really, I didn't really need to bring that many in. I got aggressive on buying, both bringing in more new vinyl and then just going after collections to help fill the space. What's interesting is when we moved here, uh, we have more records, just, uh, you know, 13 to 15,000 records on the floor here. Um, and basically, we had about 9,000, 8 to 9,000 at the old location, which was half the size of this. So it was like, okay, I gotta find five to 7,000 records to fill this out and have some inventory. Day after, day after signing the lease, bought a collection of 9,000 records, and then three days later, bought a collection of 3,500 records. So all of a sudden, I got 12,500 more records. Wow. Within, I think, 10 days of signing the lease for this new location. Wow. So it's just interesting, like that whole intention of like, I need, I want, put it out there, and all of a sudden, phone call, phone call, and boom, boom we're done. And they were awesome records, too. Wow. So. I can't believe someone unloaded a 9,000 9, piece collection. That's yeah. incredible. There's one I'm waiting on right now. That I've been waiting for a while. 60,000 pieces. Wow. Local? Yeah. Gosh. I know. We'll see if it happens, but 60,000. What does that look like? <laughs> I've yeah. seen that many in someone's you house. Rent a U-Haul truck for that? Or? I, yeah, that's what we would need to do, you know? Wow. A lot. Think about it. That would be probably about 750 to 800 boxes of records, you know? That's incredible. So we're going to move on down the road here to album number two, and that would be a record in your collection that's a personal favorite. Okay. This. This album. Oh, wow. So Santana's uh, Abraxas album, Mobile Fidelity changed their process for their MoFi records. Their and they came out with a one-step process where they eliminate two pro steps in the pressing and bring it down to one. This was the first album that they released under this new format. They released 5,000 copies of this record. This record is number 788 in wow. the series. And they did a beautiful job on these um, packaging. But they, but they also, they're all at, they're at 45 RPM. So you take a single album, single album becomes a double album. Mm -hmm. You know, artwork's in there. That seems more and more common these days with the 45 speed. Yeah, on for the records, audiophile yeah. pressings. Yeah. And yeah, this is, I, this, this is a pretty hard to come by record. Yeah, I have it on CD. You don't have a vinyl version of that, but that is a great album. Um, do you know what year that first came out? Oh, I want to say 70. Two, 71, yeah, 72 or 71, I think. Yeah, I'm not exactly sure. Do you but, remember uh, the first time you heard that record? Oh, I remember the first time I heard it. Yeah, I was a kid up at my neighbor's house, Michael Karen's house, and uh, and listening to Black Magic Woman was just, uh, yeah, it's pretty amazing. So 1970 is when it first came out. Wow. Yeah, yeah. Fantastic. All right. We're cranking them out here. Um, album number three, this would be something you're just listening to a lot of lately. And it yep. doesn't necessarily have to be a new band. Yep. Um, it could be an old band, could be a new band. Yep. It's something that just is finding its way in your turntable. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, um, so it would be Kevin Morby. This is a Whoa. photograph, and there's like two versions. For my birthday, Elisa works here. Got ordered me this copy. So Kevin Morby, <laughs> he did the little graphics on it and signed it. But okay. uh, so he did a little limited, limited run on these ones, but it's the same album. But uh, yeah, I'm not we, familiar. Tell me a little bit about so, Kevin yeah, Morby. Kevin Morby's been around. He's from Kansas City. He's got seven out this is his seventh album. And uh, it's just interesting to hear the evolution. I feel like this is the culmination of the six previous albums. So you can hear little bits of each of them in this album. Great singer, songwriter, guitar player. Um, you know, uh, this album is sort of like a, this was sort of like my COVID, end of COVID, go-to, listening to all the time. I've sold a ton of copies in this, in this store. Uh, this one uh, recorded partly in Memphis, talks a lot about Memphis, talks about you know his dad had a health scare and he's looking at a photograph of his father 
and it just brought back this flood of memories and so this this whole record is a very personal record for, for Morby and it deals with a lot of things about life. So like, is it just uh, singer-songwriter? There's a band with them. Full I mean, band? Okay. Yeah, full band. So is it rock music? It's then? rock music. It's, there's, you know, uh, it's full, uh, there's a, a great uh, duet with him and this woman Erin Ray on this folk ballad, uh, Bittersweet Tennessee is the name of the song. It's jazzy, it's got some blues, it's just, yeah. I, cool. I love this record. Yeah, I look forward to checking it out. Seven records out so you can buy them all, yeah. This is my favorite thing about doing this show is getting turned on to new stuff. Yeah, and and, and, and and I'm probably, I'm not, and I'm not supposed to do this, but his girlfriend is Katie Crutchfield. And so oh. Waxahatchee is her band. And so, like this, the year before was for, for me my favorite album. Two years ago, this is my favorite album. Of the oh, okay. Year. I love love these records, and it's just a coincidence that they're actually a couple because, uh, yeah, I didn't didn't really know that at first. But yeah, I love these two records. Right on. Yeah. <laughs> All right, Will. Well, thanks for taking a minute yeah, with us, cool. talking music. Yeah. Um, thanks so much. So, Paradise Records is on East Pearl Street in Boulder, Colorado. Uh, if you're ever down this way and want to check out a nice record store, he's got an amazing selection of records here. Thank you. Um, and uh, what else? You get a website? Yeah, paradisefoundrecordsandmusic.com. Do you sell stuff online? Play that uh, much? Or is it you just busy? We, we would rather sell pe records to real people in front of us. So we okay. don't really sell much stuff online. If there are items in the store that we've had around for a while that are good, valuable records, we'll put them on Discogs, but we have a limited offering. We'd rather sell records to people face to face. Awesome. Yeah, great. Okay, thanks for watching, you guys. Um, click that subscribe button for more music videos. And Will, thank you very much. Yeah, thanks so much. Yeah. Thank you.